Era number one. Era number two is in the field of community activity. And here, a very important arm of voluntary organization is the sports clubs. This is an unrecognized, especially football. Football clubs are a vital field of voluntary activity in this country. It is almost the only sustained form of voluntary activity which is in close relationship with young males. And from that point of view, these football clubs, as well as people involved in athletics, but in particular football, have a critical role to play in reviving and in strengthening voluntary activity. And I believe that many of these football clubs could be made into NGOs and could broaden the scope of activity and could be incorporated into the mainstream of voluntary associations and both sides would benefit. Both the clubs themselves would broaden the scope of act their activity and the existing voluntary organizations would get in touch with a young male constituency which we are too far from. But they express great willingness to participate in community level organizations. And this data was reproduced over, this finding over and over and over again. In other words, there exists in the society a certain positive attitude of people to participate in their community organizations, which you see in some of the neighborhood watches, which expresses itself also in the football clubs, and which expresses itself in other citizens and community council type organizations which have proliferated over the years. So this whole area of the reinforcement of our community organizations is an extremely important area for strengthening our voluntary activity. But ladies and gentlemen, if you really want to strengthen voluntarism, it's not sufficient to strengthen it at the community level. The reason being that Jamaica is a spatially polarized society. In fact, this very same study asks people the question, do they feel Jamaican society has spatially grown further apart in the last 10 years? Uh, what is your view? And the overwhelming majority of every person from every social background, the majority of the people said yes. What we should do is what some of us are already doing. That is to say, we should inject volunteerism into the school system. We should establish in the school system a formal system of volunteerism which in effect requires all students, or as many students who wish to volunteer, if you want to put it in that framework, to participate in activity which is socially beneficial. At the University of Technology, I believe, there already exists such a program where students actually get credit for participating in some voluntary activity. At the University of the West Indies, Mona campus, there also is a program where students participate in voluntary activity, and I think about a thousand students are involved. I think that the time has come for us to seriously examine our education system from this point of view. There is a project funded by Grace called Change From Within, which was established by Sir Philip Sherlock and others, Mrs. Saunders and others here. And this program was a pilot program which looked at a small number of schools. And it tried to establish whether effective intervention in terms of behavior could be achieved by using the school as a policy framework. And I think this pilot project, the result, the right top of it is there for everybody to read, proved extremely successful that yes, it is possible to influence the behavior of our children and our adults by careful and systematic and sensitive interventions in the school system. I think likewise, the PALS program of the, uh, organized by the Gleaner also is demonstrating that the school is a vital instrument to intervene in the lives of our citizens. Mr. Brian is a distinguished historian 
with special interest in Latin America. He has had the distinction of Fulbright Fellowships to the University Emancipation and Jamaican Society, and numerous articles in learned journals both in Jamaica and abroad. The list is too long to be detailed in this brief introduction. Suffice it to say that through his books, articles, and addresses to numerous international conferences, Professor Bryan's influence as an intellectual of international repute makes him a son of whom Jamaica is very proud indeed. <coughs> Mrs. Bryan, sadly, is ill and unable to be here, but their three daughters are here to hold up daddy's hand. Ladies and gentlemen, the Grace Kennedy Foundation is proud to receive and present Professor Patrick Earl Bryan, Master of Arts, Doctor of Philosophy. His subject, Inside Out and Outside In, Factors in the Creation of Contemporary Jamaica. Professor Bryan. If I were asked to name three factors that have most shaped Jamaica's history, I would suggest, firstly, the long history of association with the Atlantic world and especially the 300 years of British rule between 1655 and 1962. That association has shaped the Jamaican economy and has vastly contributed to the country's political, constitutional, economic, technological, legal, and cultural experience. A second factor I would suggest is geopolitical. Jamaica, an island completely surrounded by the Caribbean Sea, constituted a vital part of what the Dominican historian Juan Bosch has called the Caribbean imperial frontier. The island was the nerve center of British attack and eventually defense in the Caribbean, where British fortifications arched southwards from Jamaica following the broken line of the Caribbean archipelago. The island's proximity to the North and South American mainland has placed it in a strategic position vis-a-vis -vis the two American continents. Buccaneering attacks from Port Royal against the Spanish mainland secured the British Caribbean and under the principle of no peace beyond the line, European powers fought in the Caribbean Sea to break and make treaties to consolidate hegemonic power in Europe. The Spanish Caribbean, including Jamaica at the time, was the nucleus from which the British penetrated the Spanish mainland empire. For over 300 years, Jamaica has also fallen within the commercial and military geopolitical space of North America. The island served as a base for the re-export of African slaves to the Spanish mainland in exchange for Spanish bullion. With the gradual withdrawal of Britain in the 20th century, Jamaica joined the rest of the Caribbean in the, as the fifth frontier of the United States. Jamaica also formed a major part of the nucleus of cheap labor for United States capital in Central America and the Spanish Caribbean. Through this fifth frontier, now pass narcotics and toxic waste. Jamaica lies at the center between North and South America in narcotics trafficking. Just as in the 1920s, the island was a major center for the smuggling of opium between North and South America. A third major influence on our history was the importation of some 700,000 African slaves out of the 11.7 .7 million estimated to have arrived in the Americas over the long period of the slave trade. Africans provided the labor force for almost every aspect of economic life, introduced cultures that conflicted and synchronized with that of the European minorities. For most of the colonial period, ironically, the culture of the majority of the population was regarded as the minority culture. And this is so because when the people are conquered, their gods have also been defeated, or at best have become part of the pantheon of gods of the conquering group. European conquest never left room for other gods in, the, in this ideological drive for cultural exclusiveness. But the old, old gods survived in modified form through a process of cultural synthesis. The migration of Europeans and Africans to the land of the dead Tainos 